All right, like I said, we, I'm going to have to go ahead and start recording a little bit early. Um, so while I get things set up, if anybody has questions, let me know. Like I said, it's being recorded, so um, anybody who watches the video later can benefit from your questions. All right, still getting things set up. Welcome, Tasha. You guys let me know if you have any questions. Okay, good morning. Good morning. All right, we are set up. We're recording. We still have about four minutes left. So I might as well use these four minutes since we're recording, I guess, as reminders. Stuff that everybody should know by now, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway. Um, let's see. First of all, make sure you read all the announcements. That's always the case, but so far, other than the most recent one where I was telling everybody that um, campus has been closed, other than the most recent one, you should definitely go and read the first two announcements hopefully you've done that before you're here or before you're watching this video if you're watching this later because i don't know it's it's good to stay caught up um, and part of those first two announcements is the video of the wednesday's lecture so again hopefully you have watched wednesday's lecture before you um before you watch this one because the wednesday's lecture is all about the syllabus so make sure you're caught up before you watch this video um, i know the three of you who are currently here were there in person on Wednesday, so I know you're caught up. So at this point, I'm basically talking to whoever's watching the video. So again, before you watch this video, go back, make sure you've read the first two announcements, make sure you've read the syllabus, uh, make sure that you've watched the uh, first video. And speaking of the first video, again, just some reminders since we have about three minutes left. Um, some things you should definitely do, you should work on your independent work. I'm telling you, people make this mistake every semester. They wait and they wait and they wait, and then they turn in something and realize it's not what they thought, and then at that point, it's too late. And also, I've done similar things as a student um, where I'm like, all right, I know this is due, but I have other things that are due before that, so I'm going to do this later. And I used to call that forced procrastination. I was procrastinating not because I was lazy, but because it was almost like a triage. Like I had other things that were due first, so I prioritized them. Um, and obviously that makes sense. But I'm telling you, at least get a little bit done. You, like I've said before, you need 10 points per week. Um, and at this point, it's not too hard to get 10 points per week. Um, because it, for now, um, a, a full page paper, excuse me, a full credit paper is worth 20 points per page as opposed to 10. Um, and I don't know how much longer I'm going to have that offer going. But yeah, for now, that's what it is. So yes, get some work done. Start writing those papers. There's so many things I could tell you in the syllabus, the rules about how to write papers, what I expect and what I don't expect. But the easiest thing to do is trial and error because, again, you can turn in as many papers as you want. So even if you turn in something that gets zero credit, it's not that big of a deal because you could just turn in something else, right? Keep turning stuff in until you hit 10 points per week or until you hit 100 points per semester. 
So start doing it now. I'm begging you. Um, and mark with my words right now. Someone's going to wait until the end of the semester. Something's going to go wrong. And then they're going to ask me, like, hey, isn't there anything I can do? I'm going to refer you back to this video and this this announcement and remind you, no, there's nothing you can do. The, the due date for independent work is the due date. So definitely get that work done. Welcome, Julia. Uh, you didn't really walk into anything important. I'm just kind of repeating myself for stuff I've that I said on Wednesday. Um, the lecture will start at 8. Oh, it is 8. The lecture is about to start, um, but we have been recording, so I thought I'd go ahead and add some uh, some announcements and reminders in there. So any questions before we uh, jump into this this lecture? All right, Lewis is here too. Great. I'm going to go ahead and wait until 8.01 before we officially get started because I have a feeling some people will show up late. Um, here's a new announcement. This is one I don't think I said on Wednesday, but I, I know it's ob it's uh, relevant for some of you. You need to make sure you're signed into your WVSU email account when you log into this Google Meets. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but I think at least two of you, I had to allow you in because you're not signed into your WVSU account. Um, and usually that's not a problem. But the only reason I know that you needed to be allowed in because there was a little chime. And sometimes I don't hear that chime. So there's a possibility if we have to meet online again and you are logged in, you're not logged into your WVSU email account, that uh, you know you won't be able to come into the meeting. Not because I'm doing it on purpose, but because it you know it just slipped by me. So anyway, it's eight oh one. Let me show you one more thing before we get started. Uh, entire screen. There we go. On that note. This is going to look a little bit like a mirror. I apologize. But when I say signed into your WVSU email account, obviously you can tell if you go to your to your email, you know you're signed in. But another way you can tell is if you go up here to the top right, you know, there'll be a little circle that should have your information on it. You know, you click on it and you can tell which um, account you're logged into. And I say this because if you have more then one Google account, like I do, you can see here I have, well, anyway, I have multiple Google accounts. So Vasilios Dianellos, uh, V Dianellos at WVSU State, WVStateU.edu. I have a V Dianellos at Gmail, whatever. All right, so the point is, make sure you're logged into the correct one before you uh, try to join the meetings. There we go. We finally got all the, uh, all the logistics out of the way. So are there any questions about the logistics? or maybe even chapter one before we get started. Any questions about the, the course, the way it's run? Your first assignment was to read the syllabus, so surely you've all read the syllabus by now, and after the syllabus, do you have any questions? All right, here we go. Well, oh yeah, sorry, good grief. <laughs> one more thing. I did get an email, no, it wasn't an email. Someone verbally asked at the end of class yesterday, or Wednesday, what section are you in? Because, um, you know, section one meets Monday, section two meets Wednesday. I hope to get that information out to you. But the quick answer, and this is something you're going to need to know for your college career, if you go to my state and look at your schedule, it'll show you exactly um, what section you're in. And if you look at the one where it says week at a glance, not only will it give you your section, but it's also like a little calendar. So it'll show you exactly which day you're supposed to be at lab. There we go. Late start, but that's okay. So any questions about all that? All right, so today we're going to start chapter one. We're going to talk about what biology is. Um, we're going to do attendance by email. So the same way we did extra credit on Wednesday or for the one person that was online on Wednesday, this is going to be the same for you. So you're going to need to write down attendance words. And then by 9 o'clock a.m., for those of you who are live and in person, by 9 a.m., you need to send me that list of words. For those of you who are watching a video later in the day, Instead of sending me the words, I need you to send me a picture of the words, and it'll make more sense as we go on. So speaking of which, the first word for attendance, so you need to write this down, the first word for attendance is dog. So if you were live and in person, if you're Burton, Isabel, Julia, Larissa, Ayana, you guys just send me an email at the before 9 a.m., and the first word on that list is going to be dog. For those of you watching the video, don't send me a dog. Send me a picture of your dog or your favorite breed of dog. And that's it. Let's jump into it. Can someone please confirm 
Hold on, not yet. I know you guys can hear me. You've already confirmed that, but can someone please confirm that you can see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Thank you. Good. All right. So let's jump into it. And I will give the same disclaimer that I gave uh, last semester, which is that this is, well, this is the second time I've been teaching out of this textbook, and I'm still kind of, still getting used to it, because after doing this for 16 years from the same textbook um, and the, basically the same presentation. Like I changed it every semester, but it was small changes. After doing that for so long, you just get used to doing it. And even the slightest change has really uh, thrown me off my, my game, so to speak. But anyway, let's talk about why biology matters. I think this is a really important topic, not for the exam, just a good thing, a good thing to understand um, for any course that you take in undergrad. Like why do I have to take this course? Or for that matter, why do I have to take any course that's not in my major in biology and in, in, in undergrad? So if anybody feels like answering this question, can anybody tell me what their major is and or what they plan to do after graduation? My major is um, sports studies. I just switched it uh, from psychology, but I still keep that psychology as my minor uh, after the crashes. I'm going back to Finland and I'll probably apply for a dental school and if I don't get there which I probably won't uh, I will definitely do something with the sports studies degree. okay okay thank you for that yeah not you're one of the people that did the all about you quiz so I remember reading that now so but thank you yeah so for you biology is very relevant right so even in sport a little bit in sports studies you're gonna need to know biology especially when we talk about things like metabolism and um, respiration, things like that will be very relevant to you. And obviously dental school biology is very important. Um, as a matter of fact, you might want to talk to your advisor and see if you need to take the uh, the majors version of this course instead of the non-majors, because that might be a prerequisite for your, your dental school. But how about anybody else? Anybody else want to answer? So uh, I'm business and marketing major, and I'm planning on uh, going to grad school after I graduate. Good. Okay. So you're a good example. So for you, on paper, this class doesn't matter, right? On paper, you probably aren't going to use biology. There is one section towards the end I could find that might be a little bit relevant towards uh, business, and you'll see what it is when we get there. But for the most part, you know, this is not directly related to your academic or professional goals, which is kind of what I'm getting at because. This is still important, right? Uh, biology is very important. Now, what I'm going to teach you, what you're going to learn in this course is just the very basics. You're not going to be an expert on anything, but you will have enough ground knowledge, uh, a foundation to where when you do need to know something related to biology, you're not starting from scratch. And that's kind of the, in my opinion, the biggest reason, uh, the biggest goal of, of an undergraduate degree, right? It's just to have this broad foundation of knowledge so you can do critical thinking when you grow older, right? So for using biology as, as the example, obviously, even though you don't have any professional or academic goals that relate to biology, this stuff will be important in your life. So for example, if you come down with a disease or someone you love has a disease and now you need to do some research on it, right? What are the, you know, what causes this disease? What cures the disease? What are the symptoms, right? All this stuff. When you look at those kind of things up, you won't be starting from scratch. Or if there's two different candidates and they have two different um, plans for the environment, you know, and they're telling you this information and that information and you want to see if their information is true, well, you won't be starting from scratch. You're going to have a basic knowledge of these uh, of biology to, to where you can look those things up. All kinds of stuff. It goes on and on. Like uh, COVID-19, obviously, right? There's a lot of lies being spread about COVID-19 and a lot of smart people that I know got fooled because they just didn't have a good basic, basic background uh, of biology. Not that they weren't smart, they just didn't have the knowledge in them. Um, so yeah, COVID-19, the vaccine, uh, we've got flu season now, right? Uh, you name it, there's all kinds of stuff. And before we move to the next slide, I will say this, this is also a good independent work topic. So if you wanna write a paper, by the way, one of the few papers that will not require you to rec um, use sources you can write a paper about why biology matters. You could be specific to you, like think about your own life. Like, oh, my grandma's got 
type two diabetes. And, you know, if I ever have to look up information on that, it would help to know biology, whatever it is, you could write a, a paper about why biology would matter in your life. But anyway, again, that's just the, the, the first basic introduction. I'm going to be beat, beating that dead horse all semester. It's very important to me that you guys understand critical thinking is the most important here, not even biology, just the, the, the ability to, to be a critical thinker. And, uh, you know, that that's what an undergraduate degree is for. But anyway, before we move forward, I'll also point out these things. These pictures are from your old textbook. Your old textbook used to have uh, one page at the beginning of each chapter where they showed some pictures and it was relevant to that chapter. And they asked the question, you know, in this case, since it's chapter one, why does biology matter? And like the next chapter will be, why does chemistry matter? So on and so forth. So, cause anybody, anybody guess what this picture is in the top right? And, and if you do know what this is in the top right, what in the world does that have to do with biology? Any guesses? No guesses? All right, how about this? I'll tell you what it is, and then we'll see if anybody can guess what in the world that has to do with biology. This is the Mars rover. It's roving around Mars. It's taking soil samples. It's digging in, looking for water. It's taking pictures. It's taking atmosphere samples. It's taking temperature readings, all that stuff, right? That's what it's doing on Mars. So what in the world does that have to do with biology? Any guesses? Uh, because of that, is that robot or whatever, uh, we can like get uh, more information about like other um, planets and stuff, I like living life there. Exactly, right? I, to me, the biggest reason this, the biggest connection this has to biology is, like I said, it's looking for water. It's also looking for any signs of life, like things that are alive now or things that have been alive before, um, which is why water is always such a big deal. As you'll learn in this semester, water is imperative for life. So that's one of the reasons I always looking for water. And as a matter of fact, I read somewhere recently that they, I think they found water. Don't quote me on that yet because I saw the headline. I haven't read it yet, but I think they found some water under underground at the equator. But anyway, yeah, that's why that matters. How about, um, here's an easier question. This is just a one one word question. Can someone else tell me what this thing is on the left? Now, don't overthink it, because if you overthink it, like I can't tell you specifically what this is, if you know what I mean. But generally speaking, if a if a kindergartner asks you what this thing is on the bottom left, what would you say? A bird. A bird. Yes, exactly. Right. Yet, and let me ask you this: Have you ever seen that specific kind of bird before that you know of? No. Me either, prior to teaching this course. But yet you still knew it was a bird. And so did I. And so would most people, right? Because in biology, we have something called taxonomy, right? We classify things. We do a lot of classifying things in um, in biology. And that's just one of the examples that the first book gave. And yeah, here in biology, you're going to learn a lot of things about taxonomy, how to classify things. All right, here's this one's a little bit more difficult. And I'm just going to move forward because we're a little bit behind on time. But Obviously, what we have here is somebody working on a bike, which has, well, I mean, I guess you could argue anything has something to do with biology. But this is less about biology and more about science in general. And, you know, biology is a type of science, which is one of the things we're about to talk about. But what this person is doing without knowing it is the scientific method. He probably looked at the bike. He's like, all right, well, there's something wrong with this bike. What is causing this? And then he probably thought to himself, OK, I bet maybe this is what's causing it. So then he thought, all right, if I fix this part, then I bet it'll start working again. And then now he's doing it, right? He's doing that fixing part. Um, and then we'll see if he's right or not. And that, what I just described, is the scientific process. And we'll talk about that later in the chapter. He did an observation. He formed a question. He formed a hypothesis. He formed a prediction based on his hypothesis. Um, and he's currently doing the experiment. Or in this case, the experiment is uh, fixing the bike. Anyway, let's move forward. Why biology matters. So we've already basically talked about this. So I'm going to go through this slide really quickly. And again, I'm not going to test you on why biology matters. It's just a good introduction to a biology class, right? So why does biology matter to you? There's a bunch of reasons that your book listed. Uh, here's just some of them. And this is a good, a good, again, excuse me, a good springboard if you want to write a little paper about why it matters to you. Why is it relevant in your life? But if you have an interest in life, right? So... Obviously, do you like being alive? Uh, that's one of the reasons. But no, not just that, but also like, you know, do you like watching nature shows or you're seeing, you know, the Serengeti? Or do you like pets, right? That's an interesting life. Uh, same here, curiosity of the natural world. 
Um, blah, blah, blah. You can read all this. So, again, we've already talked about most of this stuff. Read it. Write about it. But it won't be on the test. But really, honestly, I would try your best to think about stuff like this um, throughout the semester. And every class you take, that was my key to success as a student, is when I was in a class that was boring to me, I just I tried to ignore the boredom and I would focus on why does this subject matter? And I'd focus on that. And sometimes it didn't matter much, but either way, it focused, you know, I would focus on why it mattered. And that's uh, that really does help you succeed. Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, so this chapter is broken down into two main parts. Um, the first one is, as you can see, themes and concepts of biology. And then the next part is the process of science. So let's jump into it. 1.1, the themes and concepts of biology. The learning objectives of this portion are to identify and describe the properties of life. That's a big one. You need to know these. Um, and yeah, we're about to talk about them. You needed to be able to describe the levels of organization among living things. That'll make a lot more sense once we start talking about it. And you should be able to list examples of different sub-disciplines in biology. Now, I'll remind you when we get there, but most likely I'm not going to ask you about the sub-disciplines of biology, right? We're going to talk about it. Hopefully one of them interests you, but um, I'm probably not going to ask any questions about it. But anyway, any questions about the learning objectives? All right, the second word for attendance is cat. So again, for those of you who are currently live online right now, live streaming, just sometime before 9 a.m., 9 a.m., send me that one email that includes all the words, and the second word is cat. For those of you who are watching the video, as opposed to watching live online right now, send me a picture of your cat or your favorite breed of cat. Or if you don't like cats, I don't know, send a picture of the ugliest, meanest cat you know. I guess it's the same thing for dogs, too. If you don't like dogs, uh, you can send that picture for uh, for the first word. All right, here we go. How do you find biology? Here's a good one. Can anybody answer this question for me? What is the definition of biology? Short definition, like one sentence, one statement. How do you, what is the definition of biology? Nobody? No guesses? A study of life. Good. It is the study of life. And according to your textbook that we are using, it is the study of life. According to your old textbook, um, it is the scientific study of life. So I'm going to stick with that. So what you need to know is this right here. This is a bullet point you need to know for the exam. And take note because I almost entirely or almost always – teach directly from the textbook. There's very few times I'll deviate from the textbook, and this is one of those times, so make note of it. Biology is the scientific study of life. Um, and we'll talk about some of the distinctions later. It's like, well, what's the difference between a scientific study of life and a regular study? So we'll talk about that moving up. But again, for the exam, you need to know that biology is the scientific study of life. And that might be hard because it is a multiple choice exam, and one of the multiple choices is going to, is going to be um the study of life right so make sure you remember it's the scientific study of life anyway that being said that brings up some other questions right like what does it mean to be alive right what is life if we're studying life what is life um and also like i said earlier if biology is a scientific study of life then what are the other ways you can study life not that i'm going to ask you that on the exam which is part of our conversation and then finally if we're saying biology is a scientific study of life but once we figure out what life is and what does a scientific study mean, right? What is science? So those are the questions we are about to uh, we're about to answer. So the following highlights the properties and processes associated with life. So I'm going to circle this and remind you, like I said earlier, when we were talking about the learning objectives, this is something you definitely need to know. You need to know the properties associated with life. I will say this too. I'll remind you, this will be your multiple choice exam. So you need to know all these bullet points, right? These are the characters of life. But I'll say this, for the exam, I'm not gonna have a question where I say, I need you to list all the properties of life, right? There will be no question where you have to list them all because it's a multiple choice exam. What you will get possibly is a, a list that includes all the properties of life and one of them won't be the property of life and you need to recognize that is not a property of life. 
or perhaps the other way around. Perhaps I'll give you a list of a bunch of things that are not properties of life, and one of them is, and you'll need to choose the one that it is. Um, and then finally, the third option is I'll give you some hypothetical example, like the Mars rover found this thing on on Mars, and it you know it had order, it had sensitivity to stimuli, it had reproduction, um, it was really loud. And then I would ask you, which one of those things is not a property of life? And you'd be like, oh, well, order, sensitivity to stimuli and reproduction are definitely properties of life. But loudness was not on the list. So that's the correct answer. Anyway, that being said, let's talk about all these different things. I'm not just going to tell you to, that you need to know them and not tell you what they mean. So let's talk about order and uh, stimuli, reproduction, adaptation, growth and development, regulation, slash homeostasis, uh, homeostasis, energy processing, evolution. Let's talk about them. And before we move forward to, let me also say this. These are one of those things where going to a new textbook, for example, it can be difficult. Because if you were to look this up anywhere else, you get a very similar list, but it might be slightly different. Maybe it'll have an extra thing on the list. Maybe it'll be missing a thing on the list. Maybe it'll be worded different. For example, your old textbook didn't use the word order. If I remember correctly, I think it said it was just uh, cellular. And we'll talk about that here in a second. And you'll see basically in a, in a sense, as far in this context, um, they're the, sa the same thing. But anyway, again, study your textbook. The information of your textbook is what you're going to get tested on. You can look elsewhere, but this list right here is the list you need to know and the words in which you need to, to know them. So any questions before we dive into these things on the bullet points? All right, order. Again, like I said, it's cellular, right? In, in the context of this conversation, order slash cellular um, might might be the same thing, right? And basically what I mean by that is this. Cells are the basic unit of life, which is also going to be another test question most likely. So know that. What is the basic unit of life? It is cells. It's not organisms, right? So a human is not the basic unit of life. A dog, a cat not the basic unit of life, but we have it in us, right? Um, not organs, right? A heart is not the basic unit of life. Um, not tissue, right? Muscles are not the basic unit of life. It's the things that make up those things, right? Cells are the basic unit of life. So know that. Um, which also mean, uh, means, and I'm thinking about this study guide here, another way of wording this, cells can perform all the activities required for life. That's why they are the basics basic units of life, right? Cells are alive. Now, of course, the things that make them up, we need the things that make up cells, right? We need the organelles. We need a nucleus um, and ribosomes um, and chromosomes and all those things you're going to learn about later. We need all those things to make up cells, but those things themselves are not the basic unit of life and they cannot perform all the activities required for life. So no cells this is very important. Um, again, like I was saying earlier, very few times do I deviate from the textbook. But when I do, I'm going to try to make it very clear. And I'm trying to make it very clear right here. The new textbook doesn't go on and on about cells being the basic unit of life and all that. But it's very important. So I'm including it and you need to know it. Um, so speaking of which, actually, before I talk about what your book was actually getting at, is there any questions about the cellular part? All right, so back to your textbook. When they talk about order, they're also talking about the levels of organization, right? So what I mean by that, and I've kind of been hinting at it earlier when I was talking about how cells are the basic unit of life, you know, cells are made up of organelles, right? Cells are made up of ribosomes and lysosomes and membranes and all that, right? So those are, the, those are made up of cells. So that's part of the order. And those things are made up of molecules, and molecules are made up of atoms, right? So these are different levels of organization. And in that case, I started big and started going smaller, but I could go up, right? So cells make up tissue and tissues make up organs and organs make up organisms, which is, you know, again, a human, you are an organism. Um, anyway, we'll talk about all those soon. But yes, life is ordered. Can anybody really quickly, it's not that important. So if no one has an answer really quickly, I'll just move forward. But can anyone think of an example of something that has levels of organization but is not alive? 
Nope, that's okay. That is also a good independent work topic. So feel free to write a short paper. Just answer that question. Find an example of something that has order, that has different levels of organization, but it's not alive. And I'll give you one example, and now you won't be able to use it for your uh, independent work because I'm using it. But right here, I'm looking at my computer. My computer has order. It has different levels of organization, right? There's little circuit boards, right? Those circuit boards, like I can look, if I were to open it up, I could see those circuit boards that make it up. And on those circuit boards are little things on it, right? Transistors and resistors and whatever else, all the things I don't understand. And if I were to look at those, those things are make it, made up of different molecules. And those different molecules are made up of different atoms, right? So this computer that I'm talking to you from has order, but it is not alive. So again, a good uh, independent work topic if you're interested. So any questions about order? That one's kind of vague. Um, so honestly, for studying this one, you could just, the most important thing I think is to remember the word order. But then also, again, remember all the stuff I talked about cells being the basic unit of life. So any questions about that one? All right, the next word for attendance, the third word for attendance is frog. Frog. So for those of you live streaming right now before 9 a.m., send me the one email, include all the words, and the most recent word is frog. For those of you watching the video, send me a picture of a frog. But in this case, I want you to do a Google search. Let's just see what comes up. Google your first name and frog. So for me, I would Google Vasilios frog and see what pops up. Even if it's not a frog, whatever the first image is, uh, just send me that image uh, for, for, for frog, for the third word. All right, the next one is sensitivity or response to stimuli. Um, for example, these are plan. Uh, you don't need to know these examples for the exam, but this, I just want you to understand what I mean by sensitivity or response to stimuli. So plants have them, and this particular plant, if I remember correctly, I, I forget the name of it, but it's in your textbook. Uh, if you touch it, it kind of curls up, right? The leaves curl up. That is its response to the stimuli of you touching it, right? Um, how about this? And here's one that someone should be able to answer very quickly. What does your body do when you get hot? And I don't mean any kind of big, complicated answer. A one-word answer, what's one of the things that happens when your body gets hot? Anybody? You sweat. Yeah, sweat, right? That is a response to stimuli. Um, when you get cold, you shiver, things like that. When you get hungry, you can feel it. Um, when you see a bright light, you squint, right? So once again, another independent work topic here is to write a question about the sense about the sensitivity or response to stimuli. So pick something alive, whether it be you or something else, and you could write some examples of how it responds to stimulus, right? What's it do when you poke it or get it hot or get it cold or get it wet or change the pH, you know, whatever the where the thing is that you're talking about that's alive. So you could write a paper about that. Likewise, you could all like from the last one, you could also write a paper about give me an example of something that has sensitivity or response to stimuli, but that's not alive. And I'll give you one example. And again, now you, you won't be able to use it, but my air conditioner, my HVAC in my home is not alive, but it has a thermostat. And right now I have it set to heat. So once the temperature um, drops below a certain, uh, well, temperature, <laughs> once, the, once it gets below a certain temperature, which is the stimuli, then the heater kicks in, which is the response, right? The point being, obviously, uh, that I'm getting at here is, yes, these are the properties of life, but that doesn't mean if something has one of the properties of life that it's alive. Um, it has to have all the properties of life to be alive. Also, speaking of which, uh, using the, uh, the computer as an example, because that's what I did for order, it has order. It also has response to stimuli, right? So when it gets hot, it has a little fan that kicks on. Right. So, so far, my computer has two of the properties of life, but it's not alive. Anyway, any questions about this? And yeah, like I said, there's bacteria. Basically, I don't know why your book was specific, but um, yeah, every, li every living thing has some sort of response to stimuli. Sometimes you can't see it, right? If it's a single celled organism, you're not going to be able to look at it without a microscope and see it. But yeah, it does respond to, uh, to the environment. 
Anyway, any questions about sensitivity or response to stimuli? All right, here's a big one. Reproduction. All living things reproduce. They either do it sexually, asexually, or both. But I will say this. There's going to be a whole exam where we basically talk about reproduction. So for now, that's a little introduction telling you that there's different types of reproduction. Um, that's the introduction. But we, I'm not going to ask this on the first exam. We're going to cover that later in detail. For now, just need you just need to know that re, living things reproduce. Um, which brings me back to my earlier point, right? Talking about my computer. My computer has order. My computer has response to stimuli. What my computer definitely does not do is reproduce on its own. Um, anyway, once again, really easy for independent work because, I mean, this is just really easy, but you could write a paper about how something reproduces, right? Choose an, choose an organism, choose a species, and uh, give me an example or multiple examples of how things reproduce. Um, anyway, any questions about reproduction? That one's pretty straightforward. And again, we're going to have a whole exam basically based on reproduction. All right. Adaptation, um, a.k.a. fit to the environment, a.k.a. enhances reproductive success. So adaptation arises via natural selection. In a way, another way, another word you could use for this would be evolution. I'm not going to write it. This is incredibly hard for me, <laughs> me to write like this with my, mouth, with my mouse. So I'm just going to abbreviate a lot. Adaptation, evolution, right? So your book doesn't use the word evolution, but we're really talking about the same thing here. Now, we're going to have a whole chapter based on evolution. And in that chapter, we're going to talk about the different types of evolution, the biggest one being natural selection. Um, but for now, for chapter one, you just need to know that life evolves. There are adaptations. This giraffe has a fit for its environment because it has a long neck, so it's able to eat all these leaves up here and the tall parts of the tree that other herbivores can't reach, right? So because of that, it has an advantage, has a survival advantage. And because it's able to survive, that also gives it reproductive success, right? Because guess what? You have to be alive to reproduce. So again, for now, for chapter one, you'd be you'd be fine just having a memorizing that word. Like adaptation is a property of life. Adaptation slash evolution. I'm not going to use the word evolution in the exam. But I just want you to know that that's what we're talking about when we say adaptation. Like polar bears, right? Polar bears, they have really thick fur and a lot of blubber. It helps keep them warm. That is because they are fit for that environment. It's cold where they are, right? A polar bear living in South Florida would not be fit for that environment, right? Because South Florida is hot and humid. Anyway, any questions about the properties of life? Oh, excuse me, about adaptation. All right, and again, before I move forward, this is another example. Well, I don't want to necessarily get into that. I was going to use my computer as another example of how it, how it does not evolve, but one could argue that with the help of humans, yeah, obviously computers are getting better and different, and they are being fit to their environment, but that's a whole different conversation. We don't have time for That would be perfect for an evolution class. All right, the next one. This one's also very easy, but you need to know it. Growth and development. It's in the words. That one, it just it describes itself. Living things grow and develop. Even a single-celled organism that really won't change size much, um, it still is changing. It is still growing. It's making new organelles. Um, it develops, right? It changes. So everything that's alive grows and develops. Um, I would say write a paper on that, but again, it's so basic. What would you write? Like humans grow because they start short and get tall right i don't know that's a useless paper so for this is one of those slides where i don't recommend writing a uh, an independent work paper but yeah things grow they develop um you know my computer does not grow and develop i guess the software does it changes you know as it gets updates but uh you know it doesn't do it on its own anyway speaking of growth and development how does it do it not that i'm going to ask you on this exam but there are instructions written on your chromosomes, right? Your DNA, your genes. There's in instructions that dictate how things grow and how they develop. And 
we're going to discuss all that stuff later in the, in the semester. There's going to be a whole chapter, actually a couple chapters based on growth and development. So for now, just know that growth and development is a property of life. Any questions so far? All right. It's 834. I'm doing okay on time. The next one is regulation slash homeostasis. And homeostasis, and I'm probably not going to ask you what it means, but if you don't know what it means, I find it's useless. It's useless to me <laughs> to memorize a word if you don't know what it means. So basically, the way your book describes homeostasis is steady state. So, for example, can anybody, any of you tell me what the average, the normal temperature for a healthy human being is in Fahrenheit? If you take your temperature right now, what, what should it be? Any guesses? 98.7. Yeah, right. I think that's, well, I was going to say 98.6, but it could be that. Um, yeah, something close to there, right? Because your body maintains that temperature. I can put you out in the cold right now. It might drop a little bit. Uh, I can put you out in a really you know, hot desert. It might go up a little bit. But compared to like, like I said, if I will go back with the, the example of being outside, you know, it's it's freezing out there, literally freezing. I can see the snow coming down. So it's really cold. I would say at least in the in the in the twenties. I haven't looked at the weather yet, but let's assume it's in the twenties. If you go out in the twenties, like I said, your body might your body temperature might go down a little bit, but it's not it's not gonna be in the twenties that would kill you, right? Because you have regulation, homeostasis. Your body keeps that temperature. Um same thing. I'm not going to ask you this because most people don't know. I, sh I shouldn't say that. I assume most people don't know, but your blood pH is about 7.4. And you can eat something or drink something really acidic, like margarita has lime in it. Lime is acidic. And salsa at the Mexican restaurant, uh, tomato is acidic, right? So you have all these acidic things, but your pH, your blood pH is not going to change. As a matter of fact, if it changes too much, you're going to die, right? Um, you can drink alkalized water, which is, by the way, a big scam. And I'll talk about that later. Um, and it's not going to change your pH because living things regulate themselves, right? They have homeostasis. Um, anyway, yeah, so these are just some examples. I might not necessarily ask you. I'm definitely not going to ask you to list the examples. But again, you might get a question where I'm like, all right, we found I was I was in the mountains and I found this thing and I was wondering if it was alive and I put it in water and the pH was six. So then I added some acid to the water and the pH remained six, right? So that you could say, oh, wow, it's regulating the pH, so on and so forth. So again, you don't need to memorize these examples, but yes, living things regulate their, their um, environment, which could be a little bit confusing when you think about the other one we talked about, which is regulation, or excuse me, response to stimuli. And in some ways, I argue that these are kind of the same, right? Because like I said, if if you get hot, you're going to sweat, right? That's the response to the stimuli. But the reason you're responding to the stimuli is because you're doing regulation slash homeostasis, right? Your body is trying to maintain that 98.6 uh, temperature. Anyway, any questions about this chapter? I mean, excuse me, this slide. And again, if you can think of a, an independent work topic for this, go ahead. Like I just gave some examples for humans, right? Um, how your blood pH isn't going to change much if you drink a margarita or how your temperature is not going to change much if I put you into the snowstorm, right? So if you want to think of some other examples, either humans or other organisms, feel free to do that for independent work. Energy processing. This is a huge one. We're going to have a whole exam based on this. We're going to talk a lot about energy processing. But yes, living things process energy. And the reason there's a picture of the sun here is because with a few exceptions on Earth, the sun is the ultimate source of energy. Right? Now, you specifically don't get energy, or excuse me, you don't get energy directly from the sun. Right? If you need energy, you can't walk outside naked. And just absorb the sunlight energy. Well, I mean, you can, but that's not going to give you the energy, right? When you need energy, what you need is sleep and uh, you need food, right? But that food you eat, you know, the energy that's in that food came from the sun. 
right? Because if you're eating a plant, it went through photosynthesis and it captured that solar energy and it converted it to molecular uh, chemical energy. Um, and if you ate meat, then that animal ate some plant that did photosynthesis, right? So ultimately, all the energy um, on Earth comes from the sun. And that will be a question later in the semester, but probably not on the first first exam. Probably on that exam when we talk about energy processing. But yes, living things process energy. That's why you eat food. And that's why you have to digest the food, right? Just eating it's not enough. You've got to break down the molecules and release the energy. Um, and again, another good independent work process uh, topic if you want to talk about how some give some examples of how some living things process energy. Or once again, you could give some examples of how non-living things process energy. And I'll use my my laptop again as a as an example. So now you won't be able to use it. My laptop is using DC power electricity, right? It's using DC electricity, but it's plugged into an AC outlet, right? So it had to be converted. It had to be converted from AC to DC. And that power came from John Amos, which burned coal to make electricity, right? So it burned coal, which is a chemical reaction. So we had some chemical energy there and then it released heat in the process of doing that. So then we had heat energy and that heat energy was then used to boil water and create steam. And then that steam turned a turbine. So then we had mechanical energy. And finally that mechanical energy was converted to uh, electrical energy, which is what I'm using now. So again, just one example of how some living things do have some of the properties of life, but not all of them. Um, anyway, any questions about energy processing, which we're going to talk about in great detail later in the semester. All right, here's another one. Oh, yeah, that's right. See, like I said, I'm still getting used to this new, uh, this new textbook. This is why I didn't have the word evolution written on the previous slide, because your new textbook has evolution as something... Um, is listed separately. So let's talk quickly about evolution. And again, we're going to have a ch whole chapter on this later in the semester. So for now, you need just need to know that evolution is one of the properties of life. Anyway, what is evolution? It's how populations change over time. Notice I said populations. So individuals do not evolve. You will ne never evolve. I will never evolve. This particular one shark, his name's Johnny. He'll never evolve, but you know his population will. Our population will evolve. Um, like I said earlier, it's not just natural selection. There's other ways you can evolve. It does not always result in new species or even better adapted organisms, right? So, you know, like I said, humans are evolving. We've been evolving for a while, but we're still humans, right? We haven't become a new species yet. And in some ways, we are definitely not better adapted. Um, and we'll talk about that in greater detail when we get to the evolution chapter. Um, so let me put an X to this indicating that for this first exam, I'm not going to talk about all this. I'm not going to ask you about all this because we're going to have a whole chapter on it. For now, for exam one, you just need to know that evolution is one of the properties of life. Um, I don't know. And let me think about this too because I don't like the way your textbook, I don't like how similar evolution is to, right, where you at, where you at, adaptation. So, let me think about that too and get back to you. Of course, for you guys, it's not that important because you just need to memorize the list and we're not going to dive into them until later in the semester. But I don't know. I don't like the way those two, those two are too similar for me. Anyway. Yeah, there we go. Any questions? We have now done talking about the properties of life. Does anybody have any questions um, about the properties of life? All right, good. So once again, I'll remind you for the exam, you need to know all of them, but you, there's not going to be a question in which I ask you to list them all off, right? So don't let don't stress that out. Don't let that stress you out. You're going to have a list, and you need to choose like, oh, which one of these things is not a property of life, or which one of these things is a property of life. So just keep that in mind. All right. Also, before we move forward, another good there uh, relevant thing about this topic that we're just finished, the properties of life. This is basically describes what you're going to learn in this semester, right? You're going to learn about evolution. You're going to learn about energy processing. You're going to learn about regulation and homeostasis. You're going to learn about growth and development. You're going to learn about adaptation. You're going to learn about reproduction. Um, you're going to learn a little bit about response or stimuli. To, um, stimuli. 
um, and you're going to learn about order. So all these things, basically, this is what biology is, right? Not for the exam, I'll remind you, for the exam, you need to know biology is the scientific study of life. On a more practical term, not that I'm going to ask you this, you could think of biology is, or this biology class is us learning about these properties of life. So again, like I said on Wednesday, and I hate to say it, but I will admit it, I can understand how this could be boring to some people, especially if you don't love biology. I love biology, and even I can admit that this course, because it's just teaching the basics, is not as fun as the other stuff. Like I love biology because I love to learn about like ecology and how different living things interact with each other. And I learned to learn specifically about the genome of the watermelon plant, so on and so forth, right? Very specific things. Um, but you're not here for that. You're here for the basics. And once again, before I move forward, I'll remind you, this is why I have independent work and extra credit, because I want you to be able to dig into something that in biology that is fun to you or relevant to you or interesting to you, even if it's not important to this course. Um, and once uh, one last example before I move forward, like let's say you're really into, uh, I don't know, dolphins. You're really, really into dolphins. Well, you know what? For, for this course, dolphins are not important. We're not going to learn about dolphins at all. It is biology, but it's not the basics of biology, right? But again, because with independent work, you can look into these things that you find interesting. So go out there and find the stuff that you're interested in and, and learn about it. Anyway, moving forward, I'd like to wrap this up. The next thing we're talking about, because we're talking about we're done talking about the properties of life. Let's talk about the organization, the levels of organization of living things. And we've already kind of started this discussion because we talked about the very first property of life was that we said it has order, right? That things are organized. But now here's something you do need to know for the exam. This one's a little bit more difficult than the properties of life because in those properties of life, those were in no particular order, right? Those are in no order. They just are what they are. You could have, I could have given that lecture in any order, any of those words in any order. This, you need to know these in these order, or excuse me, in this order. You know, you need to know from the smallest to the largest. You need to know the, this list. However, I will say this, just like the properties of life, you don't need to memorize this list. I'm not necessarily going to ask you. How, I'm definitely not going to give you a question where I ask you to list all these things. More than likely, I'll give you a list that includes all of these things, and maybe one of them is going to be out of order, and you just need to recognize the one that's out of order. Or if I'm getting really tough, maybe I'll give you a list of four or five of these and say, all right, put these in order. So again, you don't necessarily need to memorize these and be able to spit it out verbatim. But you need to be able to put them in order if, if, if given to you in the list. With that out of the way and with our two minutes and some change left, let's talk about this. Um, so the very smallest thing when we talk about life, right, the very smallest thing are atoms. Of course, they do get smaller if you're talking about maybe a chemistry class or a physics class. But as far as we're concerned, the smallest thing there are are atoms. And atoms come together to make molecules. And, mo and this is also, speaking of which, this is going to be a whole chapter, right? We're going to have a whole chapter on chemistry where we talk about atoms and then we talk about molecules and then we talk about larger molecules. Molecules make up organelles. Organelles are the things that make up cells. Cells are the things that make up tissue. Tissues are the things that make up organs and then organ systems. Whoops. Ah, organ systems then make, or make up organisms. Organisms then make up populations, right? So all the humans living in West Virginia, right? That's a population of, or let me use a different example. All the squirrels living on WVSU's campus, that is a population, right? They're all together. They're the same species. They're interacting with each other. That's a population. And then different populations come together to make up communities. What's a community? Well, it's sort of like a population, except it's more than one species, so now instead of just saying all oh, the squirrels living on WVSU's campus, which would be a population, we could say all oh, the squirrels living on the campus, all the living things living on campus. So the squirrels, the humans, the feral cats, the, the grass, the oak trees, right? Every living thing on WVSU's campus, that's a community. Communities make up ecosystems. And that's, again, obviously just a step up from a, an ecosystem is a step up from a community. An ecosystem is a community, except now instead of just 
considering all the living things, we're also considering the non-living things. So yes, every living thing on WV, WVSU's campus, but also the non-living things that affect it, right? So the climate in Institute West Virginia, um, the big shadow cast by Wallace Hall, right? So there's things that live outside of the shadow that don't live in the shadow, right? Because they need more sun to grow, so on and so forth. And then finally, ecosystems come together to make up the biosphere, right? The entire earth, all living things on earth and the things that affect them. So any questions about this slide? All right. The last word for attendance is not atum, but atum. So again, if you're here live, send me an email before 9 a.m. with all those words. If you're watching the video, your last word, instead of sending me the word Adam, you're going to send me a picture of somebody named Adam. And that is it. We will come together again on Monday. Thank you guys for being here um, live. I really appreciate that. I know it's 8 in the morning. It's a snow day. I understand the, that was a little bit of a sacrifice. So any questions before we, we hang up? All right, I'll be online for office hours uh, starting at 9 a.m. Um, I guess that's it. So you guys have a great day. Um, I see that a lot of you have turned in things, and I have a lot of grading to do, so I will get to that as soon as possible.